October 2nd, 1923, uh, in Florida, the Mass. Uh, we were five children. My sister was the oldest, and I had three older brothers, and I'm the youngest. My mother died when I was nine, but my sister left high school as a junior and took on my mother's role. So she kind of kept the family together for a good while. I was born and brought up in Fall River uh, till I got in the service. Uh, Fall River, before the Depression, was a very growing, active mill town. But when the Depression came, uh, mills closed, employment rate was, you know, 20, 30 percent. Um, I think the gen general, oh, I was brought up in a French-speaking Canadian family, and uh, the uh, general attitude of those who grew up during the Depression was, we didn't know we were poor. Everybody was like that. So it was a fairly happy childhood. Um, during, at the end of the Depression in the late 30s or early 40s, uh, there was a war imminent, but nothing active. Because of the limited job opportunities, young men found the service, military service, quite attractive. So, and of course, recruiting was pretty active. So many of the fellows joined up. When I uh, graduated from high school, uh, five of us classmates went to Boston, this was 1941, went to Boston to sign up for the Navy. Only one of the five was accepted. Uh, their uh, physical requirements were still very strict. Um, so, uh, I had a brother who joined uh, the Army Air Force in 19, September 1940. In September, uh, I got a job at Torpedo Station in Newport um, as apprentice machinist, and it was a great course. You know, we were four weeks in a classroom, 12 weeks in a shop, and uh, this went on for four years, presumably. Uh, but they were already on a war schedule. Although, although the war hadn't start, started yet, they were on a war schedule. It was pretty rough. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, no time off. Uh, the day was broken up into three eight-hour shifts and rotated every couple of weeks. So, and we got a day off maybe every one to two days off every six weeks or so when you might be working two shifts on the same day, so, okay. So it, it was kind of a, well, it was okay, I had a job. Oh, by the way, the rate was 40 cents an hour, which was good money because the minimum wage was 25 cents, okay? So I was kind of, you know, and I would get, at this time, however, my father and I were the only ones left at home. Uh, my two other brothers had joined the Army. And even Mary's family, we'll mention Mary later, uh, had four brothers and they were all in the service, so it was the thing to do, uh, even if you weren't drafted. So anyway, I was at the station and uh, did very well. At this time now, the draft had gone into effect. And the draft was uh, by classification, but it also considered the war effort. If you were in a job that was considered essential to the war effort, you were deferred. You had no choice. Once you were deferred, you were locked into your job, and no matter what it was, it was like being drafted to the military. So I was deferred because I was at Torpedo Station. Uh, the classifications were like 1A, you were eligible, you were up for call by lottery when your number came up. He said, you know, dear John, let's go. Uh, but in May of 43, um, 
the needs of the military was uh, pressing, so the class of the, the exempt classification was, was reduced. And uh, so I went to the, to the induction center, and fortunately at that time, we had a choice of Army, or Navy, or Marine, if you qualified. So I selected the Navy, of course. <laughs> Why the Navy, I'm not quite sure, but it seemed attractive, okay? So I was accepted for the Navy, and very shortly, uh, I went into a boot camp in Newport, which is 15 miles or so away from Fall River. So although we were very restricted, it was comfortable. Mary and I met when we were seniors in high school. And we attracted to each other and we went, you know, roller skating and ice skating and, uh, you know, movies and that kind of stuff. And it sometimes it was a little bumpy, but we kind of stayed together. And in September of 1942, uh, we were engaged. It was her birthday. Now she was 19. We were the same age within eight days, so, you know, it was kind of a good match. Anyway, we were engaged, and uh, so I had the girlfriend back home, right? So uh, I got to boot camp. Normal routine was eight weeks, but by this time, it had been cut back to five. You know, it was pressing, we had to get there. Now, most experiences of basic training were negative. Mine wasn't. I, I might be considered stupid. I had a ball, okay? Now, this because you consider the way I was living for a couple of years previously, you know, it was a great transition. You know, I went to bed every night, I had three meals a day prepared for me, out in the sunshine, fresh air, plenty of company. At that time, the, some of the branches, some parts of the Navy, still had old Navy customs. In boot camp at that time, we slept in hammocks. So the barracks were bare of furniture. There were a few benches scattered around, but we slept in hammocks. Our personal belongings were kept in sea bags, just as if we'd be aboard ship. So it, it was a great experience. The five weeks were nowhere adequate to train anybody in a military situation. What the intent was to get a bunch of guys together, get their clothing, uniforms set, give them their shots, take care of their dental work. Because dental work at the time, you went to the dentist to have to have a tooth pump, okay? So they did a great job. The Navy did a great job in tailoring uniforms, okay? So after this uh, three three week period or so, at the end of three weeks, we were allowed visitors for about two hours in a restricted area on base. So Mary came, we visited for a couple hours. At the end of the fourth week, we were allowed a, a four hour liberty in Newport. By this time, Mary was working at Torpedo Station. So she had a friend who lived in Newport and we invited there for dinner on a Sunday and spent four or five hours together, which was great. Now, at, at the end of the, well, the court, uh, there were tests giving general aptitude tests to assign people to positions or jobs that they would be comfortable with. But at that time, the Navy had developed an eddy test, which was to train radio technicians. The original requirement of radio technicians in the Navy was pretty well filled by a pool of ham radio operators. Now, I guess this pool had been exhausted, so they had to find a method of selecting people to get into this program. So the ED test was pretty rugged. Uh, it went over a two-day period, you know, about eight, eight hours a day. And it concentrated on math and science and general comprehension. You know, you had to speak English and uh, uh, problem solving, that kind of stuff. So we, I got through that. And well, I had no leave when I left uh, boot camp.
It was four weeks in Chicago at the time. No leave then. So we went from Chicago to Washington. There were several schools set up throughout the country, and the one I was sent to was Washington on the, on the grounds of the Naval Research Lab, which was in Anacostia, really, just outside the city. Okay? So uh, we went there. Now, the, the, the program was designed, a very intensive book learning type sort of program, not physical, book learning so that the attitude and the atmosphere at the school was more like being in college, the college campus rather than the military. And the program was devised not necessarily to train us on a particular piece of equipment, but to be kind of a general service on all equipment. Now, at that time, electronics was not in our vocabulary. So there was radio. Okay. Television was experimental, but at this time the Navy had developed and was manufacturing radar, uh, sonar, and, you know, all the goodies. So that the course was designed to give you the basic information, the basic concept, up through engineering. Oh, this course in, in uh, Chicago, by the way, was kind of a a refresher course. But one of the important aspects of it was the use of the slide rule. <laughs> the slide rule of the day was the pocket cap calculator of the day. So by the time we got to Washington, uh, well, every piece of equipment, no matter what it was, it was accompanied by an instruction book or a service manual, which not only took care of operation, but maintenance and repair. Now, if you're out in the middle of the ocean, you don't call the repairman. You're the repairman, right? So this was the idea of the course. And it was a very extensive course. It ran for 36 weeks. The first broken up into 12-week semesters. The first 12 weeks was this learning basic radio circuits, basic electrical theory. Um, and, you know, we designed circuits uh, uh, to, to meet uh, the design requirements. And uh, the next 12 weeks was radio communication, receivers, transmitters. Now, the Navy was very strong right along in communications. They just needed it, ship to shore and ship to ship. And then the final 12 weeks was on radar, okay? Now the schedule, we had Reveille at 5.30. Classes started at eight, and usually ran till 9.30 at night with a break for lunch and, and supper, okay? But this was on, on a five-day week. The weekends from Saturday noon to Monday morning Reveille, we were on Liberty, okay? Now, here is Fall River, 400 miles away, and I'm in Washington. The main transportation was train. It was good train service. But of course, at this time now, I'm earning, uh, I guess I'm a seaman second, and I'm earning 60 bucks a month. And this sounds pretty great, except six or eight of it was GI insurance. 25 I was sending home for some time in the future. So, you know, the, the money was kind of scarce. But anyway, after I'd been in D.C. for, you know, maybe two or three months, uh, I, I used to go into town on weekends. So I went to check on train schedules and costs and stuff. So unfortunately, I found out there was a train leaving Union Station about 12.30 on Saturday afternoon and getting into Providence, stop over in Providence, uh, about 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night. And from Providence, the Fall River was a bus ride a half hour or so. So I said, gee, this is great. Now what's it gonna cost me? Well, it was great because the train fare from Washington to Providence was $10 round trip for servicemen. It was discounted. I'm sure the civilian rate, 
been no more than twice that, but that was the fare. And the fare on the bus from Providence to Fall River was a buck round trip. And the timing uh, coming back on Sunday was not quite as direct. Uh, there was a train from Providence uh, early noon, afternoon, 1.30, 2 o'clock. But when you got to New York, you had to transfer it from Penn Station to Grand Central to get to D.C. And it would get to D.C. about midnight. So that was a little bit touch and go. But it was economical, convenient. So I got home to see Mary every you know, two or three weeks or something like that sometime. Now, on one occasion, I guess this is an aside, the, the uh, setup in, in Washington was that the instructors were in charge of the school, but we lived in a barracks, uh, you know, a couple hundred of us. And the barracks were very comfortable. They were set up in a room-type situation. No doors, but room-type situation with two bunk beds, and a conference table, four lockers, so that we were paired off you know, in groups of four. So, uh, oh, in charge of the uh, barracks was uh, an old chief, an old salt. You know, he had grizzly, had a gravelly voice, and uh, gray hair. He didn't have a beard because that was out of, out of uniform. But he had hash marks from, you know, to his elbows. He'd been in the Navy forever. <laughs> okay. Anyway, Chief Duffy was a good guy. Uh, not that we had that much contact with him unless he got in trouble. Now, Reverly was at 5.30, and this one weekend, I get back, oh, I, I must have got back to the barracks about 3.30 in the morning. So I went to try to get a nap, but I slept through Reverly. Okay. Now, the next thing I know, somebody is chasing me, and Chief Duffy is there, and I make an effort to get up, and he said, don't bother, finish your sleep. You're already on report. So I went to Captain's Mass at noon time, and I got an hour's KP. I thought that was a pretty good deal, you know. But that, that was Chief Duffy. So we got through these uh, 36 weeks, and normally at that time you would be sent out to the fleet for assignment. But they, they uh, started a project, a special project, okay? Required security uh, clearance or secret, okay? And a half a dozen or so of us were selected. And the project was right uh, at the school, isolated but at the school. Oh, and it turned out that, quote, this project was electronic countermeasures, you know, the leading edge of technology, okay? But we had no equipment, <laughs> no training program. You know, we essentially wrote the book, okay? And uh, so we spent three weeks in a classroom, actually uh, kind of keeping us together, I guess, kind of doing, we're being introduced to there were no tape recorders at the time, so the wire recorder and the uh, plastic disc for the uh, dictograph, this kind of stuff. So uh, after three weeks, we were sent to Ocracoke for what they call beach jumper training. Okay, now beach jumper, you know, touch and go. But anyway, we went and we were there for six weeks. Now Ocracoke is in North Carolina, uh, just area of Cape Hatteras and across Pamlico Sound from, from Cherry Point, okay? But by this time now, we're an elite group, so we were flown from D.C. to Cherry Point. Now at Ocracoke, quote, we were supposed to be getting jeep, beach jumper training. But, well, we were introduced to small arms, and we used, uh, you know, the Colt and uh, the Thompson and, uh, uh, we, a lot of physical activity, not drilling or that kind of stuff, but softball, volleyball, swimming, uh, running the beach. We were assigned a PT boat also. We went out into the ocean. A couple night operations, simulated operations, okay? So again, it, it was a picnic. Now, most of us had spent a sedentary life in school. And uh, I think this was probably more physical conditioning than, than training. Uh, 
But it was a great, great place. Uh, mess hall was open 24 hours a day, and we were only, with offices and listed men, no more than a couple dozen. The staff, uh, maybe it was a dozen people or so. So, it, you know, it was, it was a good picnic. So after six weeks, uh, the time was up. We returned to, to D.C. and given uh, I don't know, eight or ten day leave and got back to Mary. Uh, and then were sent to San Francisco. Now, the normal transportation was, you know, troop train or this kind of stuff. But again, quote, we were kind, kind of an elite group. So we went first class from Boston, from Washington to Chicago, and then Pullman from, now, who rides Pullman, you know, at the end of the Depression? But it was great. So Pullman from uh, Chicago to uh, San Francisco. We got to San Francisco, we waited a few days at Treasure Island, which is a Navy base, uh, for transportation. And then within a few days, we were loaded on uh, a seaplane, which I think was probably under charter, flown by military, uh, by uh, civilian personnel. And it had luxurious accommodations for for probably six or so, you know, aircraft seats, bunks, the uh, dining area. And I guess at this time there were 10 of us. Uh, the, the composition of our group was that uh, we essentially wound up as five teams, an officer and an enlisted man, okay? And uh, so there were probably eight or 10 of us. and. Uh, the trip was great. We left uh, early evening, uh, had a steak dinner, you know, the steward got it ready for us. We did not know what our ultimate assignment was. The closest we got to it was that, quote, beach jumpers. Now, we were all gung-ho. None of us were qualified to do this, but we were gung-ho, you know. I guess the intent at the time, am I going to be a hero, but that we soon got over that. Uh, so that we didn't know where we were going, what we were going to do. We knew the mission statement that was to uh, uh, identify, locate, and if possible, neutralize enemy radar. Okay, that was the gist of the thing. I'm not sure how we were going to do it and that kind of stuff, but anyway. So that we really didn't know what our assignment was. Maybe, uh, now along the way, you now we had some senior officers with us, full lieutenants, uh, who may have done somewhat, but yeah. It's not only secret to the public, I think it was secret to us, we didn't know what was going on. Uh, so then anyway, uh, we went as a group from Alameda Air Base to Pearl Harbor aboard this uh, flying boat, okay? Very comfortable, steak dinner, you know, uh, full breakfast, ham and eggs in the morning and this kind of stuff. So when we got to Pearl Harbor, we were, uh, Pearl was a, a whole Navy installation, so, but we were in an area where sink pack was now. Nimitz is sink pack, okay? Commander in Chief of Pacific. And uh, so we were there in that open-sided hut for sleeping accommodations, isolated. Uh, we had access to PX and mess hall, okay? But other than that, we had little contact with any of the people there. So after, again, after another couple of days, uh, we were called in to Nimitz's office. Now, I never met Nimitz, but his staff, very Good. So again, you know, treated like an elite group, okay? Now, we might have been sheep leaving, being led to slaughter, but we were elite, uh, which is unusual for enlisted men in the service. So after these three or four days, we uh, 
a member of the Nimit staff, uh, you know, wished us well or bon voyage, you know, on your way. Again, we still don't know where we're headed. Uh, we know we're in the Pacific somewhere, but we don't know what we're going to do. So we got, uh, uh, again, first class travel, we got a plane, uh, a military plane from uh, Pearl Harbor heading out into the Pacific somewhere. And uh, there was a stopover around noontime at Johnston Island, a thousand miles away, yeah, and lunch and uh, uh, refueling. And eventually, and I'm not quite sure the last part of the trip, but we got to Kwajalein. Now Kwajalein, at the time, was an operating base for the Navy, okay? Uh, operating base at that time meant, is there sufficient anchorage spaces, a harbor or the protected uh, uh, protection of the atoll, providing enough to accommodate 100 warships, okay? because the, the fleet composition at that time was about 100 ships. So we got to Kwajalein, and uh, I have the, the V-mail that I sent Mary from Kwajalein, first experience of sleeping in a tent. Now these islands were, other than the people there and a the few facilities, were, were desolate. They were, the palm trees were blasted, it was sand, uh, no houses, or other than a few facilities the military was putting up. So we were there for a couple of days. And <laughs> By the time we got aboard ship, we realized that all of these previous declarations and plans was probably just to kind of keep us active and together until we finally got to the battleship. By the time we got to the battleship, crates of equipment were waiting for us, okay? What the Navy labs and uh, manufacturing facilities has done is to adapt existing equipment for the use, okay? The, the requirements for use was, it was kind of, you know, the technology kept advancing. Our association with, quote, shipmates was not uh, that close or lasting. Now, going to school was almost uh, a, a private life, okay? The time that we spent in Ocracoke, we were able to get acquainted with, we still didn't know how we were going to be grouped, but we still got acquainted with a half a dozen officers. Some of the enlisted men, not that we had gone to school together, but we had spent several months together. So the, the bond or the closeness was really not there. Well, partly also because we were just a team of two, officer and enlisted men. At that time, in the Navy, and I would guess so in the Army, there was a big distinction, class distinction, between officers and enlisted men. So being close was not the order of the day, okay? You might be close to an enlisted man, but not, not with an officer. Anyway, so there was very little bonding between a pair of us. Now, a battleship is an awesome thing, okay? It's a crew of 2,000 normal crew of 2,000, okay. Now you have to consider that the ship has to be capable of providing for 2,000 hungry guys, okay. Now it's fresh water, the big thing, so they were equipped with uh, evaporators with converted seawater to fresh water. The capabilities must have been uh, at least 10,000 gallons a day. Bread, okay. At least a thousand loaves a day that would be baked daily. Fresh bread was, was a big thing. Okay, and then food and supplies, apart from the ship's operation and its intent as a, a gun platform. Okay, battleships were equipped with uh, nine 16-inch guns, uh, awesome guns, uh, into three turrets, capable of projecting a shell 20 miles. Right. And then 25-inch guns, 
in 10 turrets, twin guns, okay? Innumerable 40 millimeter, 40, 40 millimeter mounts and 20 millimeters, okay? So it was a fortress, a huge firepower. Operation of the fleet, it was broken up into four battle groups, and each battle group consisted of the main focus of aircraft carriers. There were four aircraft carriers, generally. Uh, two major carriers, two baby carriers. The major carriers could put up 60 planes, and they had another 30 or 40 in reserve, and the small carriers might put up half as many, 30 planes. So the focus was to protect the aircraft carriers. There were two battleships in the center. The formation covered maybe 10 miles, a, a, a battle group, okay? Uh, there were two battleships and generally two heavy cruisers and uh, 12 or 15 destroyers that did the outside perimeter. They were the forward early warning, not necessarily early warning, but anti-aircraft protection, okay? So that, and there were four, usually four battle groups in the fleet. Well, we got aboard in, in Kwajalein. From Kwajalein, the fleet now moved uh, stepping stone type to Anawitak, Ulithi, the closer we got to Japanese homeland. By the time I got to the ship, I was a second class petty officer. This all immediately made me different. Uh, I might have felt special, but the crew kind of resented it, you know. But anyway, because of our location, we were uh, set up. Our duty station was on the sixth level of the superstructure. Now you look at a battleship and there's this big stack going up in front. And that's about 80 feet out of the, above the waterline, okay. The space up in that area was maybe about a 15 foot square area, and it was divided into four compartments. One of them was access from the lower levels and also access to the upper level, and one of them was a workshop. The other one was where our equipment was, and the fourth one had a radar transmitter that we had very little to do with, and a desk and a swivel chair, okay? So it was, and it was very isolated, okay, physically. Plus, in addition, there was a big sign on the, the, the hatch that came in, said restricted, okay? So I was pretty isolated from the rest of the ship's crew. And at that time, aboard ship at least, where we were, uh, diaries were prohibited under pain of court martial, okay? So I have no record of day-to-day -day, uh, times, uh, dates. Plus, being up in this enclosure, okay, uh, and the ship moving, okay, I had no concept of moving. Felt like I was sitting still and the rest of the world was coming to me whenever I got topside, okay? So, I guess by using the present terminology, I, I was lost in space and in a time warp. Sometime in September, few months after I'd gotten aboard ship, we went to Manus, which is in the Admiralties in the South Pacific, across the equator. Uh, and the reason we went there was that the ship needed major hull repairs. I don't know how extensive they were. Okay. Now the distinctive thing about Manus is it had a dry dock. Not the usual Navy Yard dry dock. This was a floating dry dock. Sections of U-shaped tanks that are fastened together. Now imagine raising 45,000 tons with the battleship weight out of water. But they did it, and we were there for about a week and repaired. Another experience, it's a typhoon, okay? Now the typhoon say, oh, it's a battleship, 45,000 tons, what's gonna happen to it? A lot can happen to it, right? I never, I was never seasick even then, okay? But many of the old salts were seasick. You know, the ship would roll from side to side. We were up about 80 feet out of the water, okay? And waves, 
or sprays, but a sheet of water would reach that high. Now we had an outside vent bringing some fresh air in. He came in through the vent. And another, <laughs> this was kind of funny, but not serious, but funny. During that period, of course, for a day or two, we were at general quarters, which means everybody's in a battle condition in sealed compartments. Uh, the fires are extinguished, uh, so we lived on sandwiches and bug juice. Uh, bug juice is a term for the Kool-Aid or equivalent, okay? Uh, so but all of our leisure time was spent in the general quarters station, okay? And uh, the rating I had entitled me to the swivel chair, okay? Now, that normally was comfortable. <laughs> When the ship was rolling from side to side, the, the swivel chair didn't have brakes, okay? So on one of the particular cycles of rolling, it went out well, to a steel deck, and generally it oiled them to keep the rust down. The, the, the chair went out from under me, okay? And this would be funny, except that my back was next to the bulkhead, or the wall, that has welded studs on it to mount equipment, Okay, so in my back, you know, I got a big, it was a gash, I, I didn't know, I didn't see it, it was a gash. Shirt was torn and all this, you know. Now, to me, well, it was kind of serious. I was laying on the floor, didn't know what the hell happened. But the guys had a ball, they laughed, it's like, hey Norm, we can put you in for the Purple Heart, you fell off your swivel chair. The move was scheduled around active campaigns. Now, when we joined the fleet in Kwajalein, the Marianas had been invaded. This is Yat Palau, Peru. Had been invaded, not secured yet, and the ships had taken part in, in that operation, okay? Now, between, uh, you lift it between uh, Kwajalein, and in a wee talk, there were air actions, the beginning of the Philippine operation, the China Sea operation. Uh, the move from in a wee talk to Ulithi was, you know, after uh, Guam, before Iwo Jima, I guess. So that, yeah, it was phased in after the island was secured and uh, set up. Quite a few of the more forward islands also developed airstrips and, uh, so that the air forces could go. So this was a place to congregate the fleet for resupply, minor uh, repairs, uh, resupply both of food and fuel. Now fuel uh, was, uh, we could refuel at sea and we did maybe twice a week or so because it was not allowed for the fuel to run below 90% or something. So we fueled very often. And uh, you know, the tanker would put up alongside, hoses, very touchy situation, hoses put across and tied up together, not really tied, but synchronized, and this was a touchy operation. The identification of radar is pretty much like, you know, a radar set, you tune the channel and you get the picture. But this was done manually, the tuning dial, to, to get a signal that you got on your earphone and to analyze it. Uh, so radars were identified by their frequency, carrier frequency, pulse, width, and shape. Radar operates on a, a principle of echo. They emit a pulse of energy and measure the echo coming back, okay? Uh, so pulse width and pulse analysis. So, the equipment was, you know, the receiver, uh, an oscilloscope, which was a leading edge technology to look at the wave, uh, at the pulse, and uh, then a wave analyzer that broke it down into frequencies and stuff like this. In addition, there was a transmitter, a noise transmitter, okay? The intent had been to, once you intercepted 
and then they signal that you generate noise to jam their response, okay? Now we, after we got the, uh, our first uh, objective was to set up the equipment, getting operated, so when we got the transmitter operating and turned it on, within a few minutes we were told to shut it off. <laughs> Apparently it was jamming our own equipment, okay? No matter how it was designed, I guess because it was so close, to the transmitters aboard ship or, or the receivers that just jammed out or something. The trans the noise transmitter was never really used uh, in, in operation. We got the equipment set up and operating, and now we had to get a crew of three or four to, to operate it, maintain it. Shifts were 24 hours, four on, eight off, and it just repeated itself. So we got a crew of great guys. So these really were the only ones I was close to. And not, again, not that close, because the time we were together, I mean, the period of time, was rather short. And the effect of the countermeasure would be essentially how many intercepts did you make and how many did you neutralize and so forth. Now, the Japanese, we weren't aware of this. The Japanese were not very advanced in radar. They did have some radar land stations on the islands early on, okay? We never got close enough to the Japanese fleet to say, to find out if they were equipped with radar. But one instance, and I guess it was, I'm not sure again the, the date, but it was about the time of the Tokyo raid, okay? Now, night operations, air operations, were very restrictive because of vision, light, okay? On a bright, moonlit night. There. On the other hand, carrier operations, retrieving a plane on this, you know, posted size stamp flight deck was a touchy, under best conditions, a touchy operation. So we seldom, as far as I know, had night flights, okay? But on this particular night, we got a couple cook enemy signals, okay, two different bearings. Oh, we had a directional antenna that we could get a bearing. No way of measuring distance, but we could get a bearing. Now, we were very closely associated with CIC, aboard ship, which is the Combat Information Center, communication, radar, uh, all the good stuff. So we were, not that we, were there or worked with them, but when necessary, we were in, in contact with them. So when we got these enemy contacts, we notified CIC of enemy contacts, and uh, so I went down to CIC and we used big lucite plotting, plotting boards for, for targets, okay? So I did, one of the uh, operators was giving me bearings and I was plotting it on the board. We were able to coordinate our signal with a bogey. Now, a bogey is an unidentified signal, okay? So they had a couple bogeys out there, and we were able to correlate our position, our uh, bearing, with, with their bogeys. Now, and you know, how do you measure what's happened? Uh, after a while, the signals went off the air, and the bogeys disappeared. We had sent up night fighters, until now, I didn't know much about you know, airplanes or anything like this. But I think they were called Black Widows, and these were P-80s, I think. And I guess they were equipped with some radar or detection device. So I guess we put up a couple of Black Widows, and uh, it's been successful. The following night, same thing happened, okay? Same results. So, and that, now, at this time, we're thinking, gee, we're doing a pretty good job. Our first experience, pretty good job. But I get called down to the Admiral's quarter the following day. We got an attaboy, pat on the back, and said, job well done, Barry. Operations I was in, and again, I was isolated, so 
occasionally I would get to know what was going on. Now my only visual contact with the outside world was a porthole in the back of the sixth level that faced the rear of the deck so that I had, when I was off duty, had a clear vision of what was going on back then. So later on, when I get home and the kids were little, I'd say, Dad, what was it like? All I could think of was like being in a movie, okay, and watching. Getting back to Iwo, what I remember about it was that we were there for pre-invasion bombardment and uh, support for a day or two after, and then we kind of left, and hopefully the Marines or the Army uh, would now, there was resupply and all that, but we weren't involved with this. When they talk about bombardment, it's awesome. These 16-inch guns, okay, nine of them, broadside, lobbing these 16-inch shells 20 miles, okay, and the concussion is aboard, even aboard ship, yeah, like, like a gorilla grabs you, you know, squeezes you if you're exposed. Uh, and then in addition, the five inch guns, you know, uh, were used for select targets and so forth. Now then this went on, as I remember it, in diminishing uh, firepower, like for three days, okay? And then after that, randomly, pretty much. Now the thing that I remember seeing on Iwo Jima was there were air attacks going on also from the aircraft carrier, dive bombers. I remember watching, by this time, I guess maybe it was, the most action was earlier in the morning and kind of lit up through the day. I think some of us were allowed topside. So I remember seeing this dive bomber go down in the backside of, uh, it, uh, the, the name will come to me, the, the, the volcano at the end, Suribachi. Now we were, you know, the south side, we were patrolling the south side, and uh, this dive bomber, Navy dive bomber going down, we never saw it pull out of the, the dive, okay. Again, later in the day after the invasion, early progress of the invasion, I remember again being topside watching a Japanese army truck going up the outside of uh, Suribachi, maybe about halfway up. And at this time, in the time of the day, the five-inch guns were allowed, with permission, to select random targets. So one of our five-inch mounts, or maybe two, I don't know, started concentrating on this truck, okay? And you could see the explosions, first following, then leading. Next thing I know, the truck was gone. The thing that surprised me was, were, the, those of us who were watching cheered like somebody had hit a home run at the ballpark. Okay? And I, I, by this time, I said, you know, what's happening to us? You know, they're guys just like us. They're doing the same thing. But anyway, that was the situation there. Any feeling I had was the, and I'll call it, propaganda before you know, before we got in the service. Now, the propaganda, there was no TV and radio commercials were not that uh, frequent. The, the armed forces of propaganda were posters. And there were these posters all over the place, you know, loose link, loose lips sink ship. And the Japanese were pictured as slant-eyed, bug-eyed, buck tooth, you know, brutes and stuff. And the Germans were, you know, storm boots and that kind of stuff. So that it was, unfortunately, inspiring, but inspiring to violence. Of course, Roosevelt's job was to get the whole nation with him, okay? And how do you fight an enemy when you love them, okay? All right? So that was the only thing, that, the only exposure I had. Also, at the Iwo operation, we picked up an enemy signal land base. Okay? Uh, no, we could get a, a direction on it, but no, no distance. So by triangulation, the ship was 
not the control, but the, the position of the ship was essentially correlated or turned over to us, so we could correlate our bearings with the ship's position relative to this unknown target. So by triangulation, they apparently uh, decided where it was. And again, as the targets of opportunity, when the five-inch gun mount was uh, uh, targeted on us. Now, again, after an hour or so, the signal went off the air. So we said, well, something's happened. We think we got it. After uh, our bombardment of Iwo Jima, and before Okinawa, which was April 1st, you know, a month and six weeks later, the kamikazes started after us, okay? Now, we were fortunate that they ran out of pilots and planes because they were effective, okay? Now, I told you I had vision out to the uh, center of the ship, and out there was the Franklin, a major aircraft carrier, maybe 1,500 yards off or something, so although a distance away, but visible, okay? Uh, and it got hit, and uh, by the time I got to see it, uh, it was listing uh, smoke, explosions, guys going over the side. Uh, we did some recovery with hopefully survivors, but I know we may have picked up some survivors, but I know that we had a burial at sea a day or two later, and there were six bodies, okay? Uh, and that, that's emotional, okay? Burial at sea, again, maybe custom, I guess it's still done this way, is the, the body is sewn into a canvas bag, a five-inch shell, a latte, put between his legs and dumped over the side. But there was a ceremony, a very brief ceremony associated with it. The captain or the chaplain will read the come and commend you to the deep and all this sort of stuff. Uh, the, the body is placed on a, on a mess hall table. Now the mess hall tables have collapsible legs, so the front part of it leaning on a rail and the back part is picked up and dropped over under a flag. Brief, very brief ceremony, but very, very emotional. You know, it could be you. Well, the kamikaze attacks, th there were several of them, but the most outstanding one was the uh, period was uh, through that between Iwo and Okinawa. Then our next oper the operation I was in uh, was Okinawa, which is April 1st, 1945. And again, the usual routine, we were there three days ahead of time for bombardment, and a couple days after for the landing. Now, after this point, now we now enter the middle of April with something like this. And this is the last stepping stone to Japan, okay? So that plans were being made for the invasion of Japan. To, to Seattle or to Bremerton in, uh, I guess, uh, June, uh, mid-June, uh, 1945. The war's still on. Uh, and then we were going to be there for a couple of months. So we were granted leave uh, in two sections uh, of about three, four weeks or so. Now I selected the second section to give Mary time. Mary wanted, had waited a long time for a wedding. And she wanted, uh, I guess, as much as we could do. So I figured taking the second group, which was, you know, three weeks or a month later, would give her time to prepare for the wedding. So I sent her a telegram. Now, telephone, long distance telephone communication was terrible. Well, lack of equipment, plus restrictions. Uh, very often, if you made a long distance call, you'd be questioned, was this call necessary for the war effort? So there were restrictions. So the, the best way of communication was telegrams, okay? Sent her a telegram from Seattle. 
and then wrote to her and told her what was going on, and then told her I would send another telegram on my, when I was on my way from Chicago. And so I, uh, I get home, uh, I think it was July 23rd or 24th. Now she had planned the wedding for the 30th, July 30th, a church wedding. And I, being in the military and under restrictions, I thought I'd get married in a uniform. I said, no way, you're getting married in formal wear. So Mary was the boss, so we got married in formal wear. Had a big wedding breakfast, and for that time, of course, it was big. I don't know, it was 60 or 80 people. But remember that uh, food was short and, you know, restaurants were cramped. And then we had a, a reception at their house. And again, I, I'm kind of in, uh, lost in space in the time warp. Okay, now I come from the routine of a ship, and I come home to all these happy people, friends, uh, family, and things going on, Mary getting ready for the, for the wedding and so forth. But it was a great wedding. And then we went away on a honeymoon. We had a couple weeks. Now, going away on a honeymoon now, you know, people take cruises or reserve a couple of weeks at some uh, resort, something like this. Well, at the time, it's still under wartime restrictions. Travel, accommodations, okay? So now, but of course, uh, my routine was that, you know, I'm planning the honeymoon. My last act of independence, okay? Maybe I should have consulted Mary, but we did pretty well. So we wound up, I decided to, I had a buddy, Rocky, who lived in Syracuse, and he always was talking about Saratoga Springs, and, you know, the racetrack, and Saratoga itself, and the quaint town. So I decided we'd go to Albany and, and uh, investigate Saratoga Springs. So we did, went there for a couple of days, and uh, then went down, I thought, you know, Busman's Holiday, Hudson River Dayline, for a day trip down the Hudson. Mary didn't think it was good. I don't think she enjoyed it very much. But anyway, we got to New York City. Now, no reservations. We know what we want to do. We know where we want to go. But the uh, traveler's aid for servant service men was fantastic, okay? So from Penn Station, we got to Penn Station because that's where travel aid was. So we went to service uh, to Traveler's Aid, and they set us up with, with rooms in the Pennsylvania. Now, the hook was that they could only get you for two nights, okay? But they said, well, you know, when your two nights are up, come back and we'll set you up somewhere else, okay? So we had two nights at the Pennsylvania, and I think this was the time of the uh, first bomb, Hiroshima. Then we spent two nights at the Commodore. Now, these are first class hotels, right? You know, and I've got the bills that show, you know, $6 a night. Now, these are probably discounted servicemen's rate, but they're probably no more than twice that. So then from there, she wanted to see Washington. I had spent some time there. So we went to Washington for four or five days, stayed at the Dodge, which just off the mall, first class hotel, six bucks a night. Now, since then, there's been a lot of controversy and discussion about why should we have used the atom bomb. By my, you have to judge that by the, the time, uh, the events leading to it, the general attitude of people, okay? And from our experience, and I guess it was the military's conclusion, that the Japanese resistance, determined resistance in fighting, you know, it's more honorable to die than to surrender, okay? And from the personal experience of written accounts of Iwo Jima and Okinawa, okay, they weren't giving up. My feeling was that from those projections, I think the use of the atom bomb was justified. My personal feeling at the time, boy, was I glad the war would be over 
And they were tenacious people. I mean, it took two bombs to convince them to surrender. We get back home. I was due back to the ship, I think it was August 17th. And uh, we get back to Fall River maybe on the, on the 12th or something like this. Had a couple days together. Now at this point, now with uh, people, uh, papers and people are talking peace. Okay, Japanese are gonna surrender, okay? So we kind of kept hanging on to see what was gonna happen. But then we got to the point where we had to leave and uh, what was set up was she was gonna come with me to Boston. She had an aunt and uncle who lived in Boston. She was gonna stay with them. So she was coming to me to Boston. I was gonna leave from Boston and meet Rocky in Chicago by train and then fly, fly back to the ship. So yeah, we waited and waited and finally we took the bus to Boston. And when we were about 10 miles out of Fort River, all hell broke loose. Bells ringing, sirens going, people yelling and screaming, cars pulling alongside of the bus, passing bottles, you know, this kind of stuff. So it was a big time, okay? When we got to Boston, uh, we spent three or four hours on Boston Common with 100,000 other people. Fire engines out, you know, people hanging on fire engines. It was a big blast. But then the next morning, it was time to go back to the ship. Now, the war was over, so, you know, we didn't have to worry about that. We were married, okay, a couple of weeks. And uh, so I, I was on the way back to the ship. So it was kind of a tearful parting, but uh, we didn't know when I'd come back or what was going to happen, okay? When I get back to the ship, uh, the, they were, the repairs had pretty much been finished, so we were preparing to head down the coast. Now, we were scheduled to be in Philadelphia for October uh, Navy Day, October 27th, okay? So we went down the, uh, the California coast and through the Panama Canal. We stayed a couple of days there and then headed up and then into Philadelphia, okay? Now, Panama Canal, that was a great trip, it was fine, you know, going through the locks. And, and we have kind of related to it because the canals, the battleships width of beam was determined by the width of the Panama Canal, so like 106 feet or something like this. And it's the only time that the ship gets washed down in fresh water, so Gatun Lake, fresh water. And there were civilians coming aboard and a big party and all this kind of stuff. But then when we got to Philadelphia, Leroy and I were uh, recently married, so he made arrangements with his wife to come to Philadelphia. I made arrangements with Mary. And we rented rooms. Homes were open to us. You know? He rented rooms, you know, a couple of bucks a week and uh, was there. So Mary came to Philadelphia and uh, I think we spent about a month there together. Leroy and his wife were just neighbors to us. So during the daytime when Leroy and I were aboard ship, the girls would be out together. So we are company from each other. I must admit that nighttime, we didn't spend too much time together. <laughs> anyway, so that, that was the story of Philadelphia. But the ship was open to the public, so, and Mary had never been aboard, so she was interested in seeing what the ship was like. So now we go aboard ship, and it's a happy time. We're greeted, meet people, the whole big time. So then she wanted to know where my station was. And I, this is up in the, you know, in the superstructure. So we saw on the access is ladders. And when they say ladders, they don't mean stairways. They mean ladders. It might be rails on them, but they're ladders. So we're going up the ladders, and she's saying to me, no, I'm standing at the bottom. I said, man, you'll be all right. Just hang on and get up there. She said, I know I'll be all right. I don't want some other sailor looking up my shit. <laughs> that was Mary. to go in. Uh, he went for training uh, in Chicago. I believe it was the University of Chicago who was putting on a training program. So he trained for aircraft mechanic, radio, 
So when the war broke out after Pearl Harbor, they were the group, the first group, to wind up in active service. So he, was, he wound up in the South Pacific with the 5th Air Force. But the last letter I got from him, uh, I was in Washington in the Navy. And Freddie, who was not a complainer, he was a pretty active, joyful, happy, happy guy. But this letter sounded kind of down, you know. And the thing I remember was that he said the most, the thing he missed most was cigars. So I was in the Navy uh, in Washington, D.C. at the time. So I uh, bought him a box of cigars and sent it to him. Well, a few weeks or a month later, I get a letter from my sister telling me that Freddie had been killed in action. So, and the body hadn't been recovered. The action was over Rabaul, which is in New Britain. Uh, and the Japanese had established a very strong air base at that point. So his plane was shot down somewhere in that area. Now at that time, you know, the, the military came to the house and presented my father with uh, Freddie's medals, distinguished flying cross that he had earned a few months previously, a purple heart. So that seemed to be about the end of Freddie's story. But in November of 2001, I, got, I was a sole family survivor. I got a call from the Army Casualty and Mortuary Affairs. Actually, this was um, a contract group searching out the families of the missing personnel. Now, Freddie was assigned to a B-25 with a crew of four. A B-25 is a medium bomber, two-engine medium bomber. They were operating out of Port Moresby in New Guinea, and, uh, which was you know, a few hundred miles from Rabaul in, in New Britain. Um, then they were searching, this contractor was searching for family members of casualties. So I identified myself as a brother and so forth. And they advised me that in a few weeks I would be contacted by the case officer who was handling for the case. So I was, and the original story was that there were remains found that at the site that uh, they thought might be Freddie's crew, and that someone would come to the house to get a blood sample for DNA analysis when they had the remains. So, and then this progressed, well, I was given kind of false hope. This case officer says, we hope to close this in a year, okay? So a year went by and dry. I kept getting in touch with them every few months, but there were no new developments. Until like early 2004, finally got a call and said, or I, I had called them, I guess, and I said, well, here's the story. There were four unidentified remains in Manila, and we're planning to uncover those and analyze the remains. I said, how the hell did you get from, you know, uh, Rabaul to Manila? This is 2,500, 3,000 miles. Anyway, so it kind of, that's as far as it got at that time. But in September of 2004, uh, I got a letter uh, saying that um, there would be a meeting of family members in Hartford. And I was reluctant whether I should go or not, but Maureen, my daughter Maureen said, Dad, you gotta go. So we went anyway, it was great. There were over 200 family members that assembled for this meeting. The first part of the meeting, they introduced us to what was going on, who the people were, and this kind of stuff. And I was brought up to date was, there was a group formed in uh, 93 to coordinate this effort of recovering remains and identifications. Previous to that, each service conducted their own search. 
And, so, and finally in 1996, this group was given the authority and the responsibility of getting the thing going. So uh, this was a general meeting, but after the general meeting, we had the occasion to meet with the case officers that I had been in touch with and the specialist that handled that area, okay? So the story at this time was more complete uh, and we were provided with the Freddie's death record. The story was that back in 1946, either an Australian or an American grave registration team had been to the area. Now the area was very precisely located from after action reports that the guys turned in, okay? And th there were three witnesses of accompanying planes that pin pinpointed the area. So they searched the area, and it's kind of vague at this point because they were searching the whole area of the South Pacific. Now these are islands hundreds of miles apart. Whether it was an Australian team or an American team, they've been there, excuse me, in, in 1946, and had investigated the site, recovered the remains, uh, searched through the wreckage of the plane to identify the plane, and the remains were sent to the Australian Military Cemetery in New Guinea. Sometime later, the remains were transferred to Manila Military Cemetery. Still is unknown, okay? But the interesting thing was that it was a group of four, okay? And then when they finally got to me, uh, the remains, well, of course they had to locate the family of four crew members so that you could get samples for DNA. Uh, the remains, at the time we were in Hartford, the remains had been transferred to Hawaii and would presume, now we begin to think, now this is the end of the story, but come to find out at this meeting, this group is handling tens of thousands of missing in action, and POWs, for World War II, uh, Korea, Vietnam, uh, even through the Gulf War. Okay? So now, you know, this false hope I had was kind of, well, maybe I'll hear the end of the story while I'm still around. But they're working very hard. It's, it's amazing. You know, this is 60 years later, and they're, they're doing a terrific job. When I look back, what does it mean? means that I did my job. It was a reasonably pleasant, exciting experience. It got me away from a Fall River. I'd never been away more than 40 or 50 miles. I got to see other parts of the world, meet different people. The most important thing was my training in electronics. And it became a lifelong career for me, okay? So, not that I ever say, hey, Uncle Sam, thanks, but I, I was appreciative for, for getting the training. I developed a pretty close relationship with a few of the guys. And we kept in touch after we got out, okay, uh, for a couple of years, but then we all went our separate ways, so. And I don't belong to any organization. I kind of, kind of stayed away from that for no particular reason, okay? And when we got back home, we really didn't talk much about our experience, maybe in my family particularly because Freddie had been killed. But in most families, even Mary's families, oh, something would come up occasionally of an event and we might relate to it. I guess not the general attitude that we were unhappy about it or was a difficult part of our life. It was something we had to do, we did, now we got home, got on with life. I have four children, uh, three daughters and a son. The daughter's a local and uh, the son's in California. My wife died five years ago or so, so I'm, I'm living by myself, but my daughter's called daily and they say, keep me out of trouble. 
And I think my big blessing is since Mary has died, I would probably be lonely and kind of sad. Uh, I am sometimes, or emotional. But we're able to talk about her, to enjoy the good times, the experiences that we had together, okay? So I feel, no, I don't know how to find spirit or soul or afterlife, you know. That, that's, I, can, I don't have a feel for that. But I have a feel that Mary is still with us in spirit. We can talk about it. It's, you know, it's almost as if she's there with us. Well, I think the biggest change was uh, the change in attitude to me and uh, friends, the attitude about war. Uh, World War II, we were gung-ho, we were fought, we were preserving the wall, the, the world. Uh, now, I, I can't agree with, with the war that's going on. It can't be justified, really. I guess some of them, you know, you've got to do something, but it seems not enough effort is being made for peaceful solutions. I think the war and all experiences in my early life has kind of formed my character, kind of formed my outlook on life, okay? And I guess I was fortunate that I never visioned things in a negative light, okay? Boot camp was a party. Most people didn't think so. Uh, service in, in, in the military was a drag, but it was a job to be done, and at times, if you reflect, it was enjoyable. Working was always a challenge. Uh, new adventures, look for adventures, look for not, you know, not spectacular things, but you know, that you looked every day as a new experience.